Welcome to Debate Night on KOAT. I'm Shelley Rabando. And I'm Doug Fernandez. We are partnering with the Albuquerque Journal and KKOB Radio to allow you to hear from three men who are running to be the mayor of Albuquerque. It is the biggest city in our state with a population of 564,000 people. The mayor leads a city with 26 departments and about 5,800 employees. Tim Keller wants to keep his job. He was first elected in 2017. His challengers are Manning Gonzalez and Eddie Aragon. Gonzalez is the Bernalillo County Sheriff and Aragon is a radio host. The race is nonpartisan and tonight I'll be moderating the debate. Our questions will come from Shelley Rabando, KKOB radio host Bob Clark and journal reporter Dan McKay. The questions have all been selected from an editorial board from KOAT, The Journal and KKOB radio. In the next hour, you'll hear from each candidate. They'll have a minute for opening and closing statements. When questions start, each answer will be a maximum of a minute and a half long. 30-second rebuttals are called at my discretion. We will start now with opening statements. Mr. Aragon was chosen to go first in a hat draw. Your 60 seconds begins now. I'm Eddie Aragon, and I'm running for mayor of Albuquerque because I'm tired of people talking bad about the city that I love. I'm tired of people leaving for a lack of opportunity. I'm tired of crime and homelessness and vandalism and panhandling, pushing away companies and families and entertainment venues that would otherwise love to make New Mexico their home. I'm tired of seeing despair and poverty on the streets and lofty political promises from our officials. I realize there are a lot of people out there who are just as tired of the constant bad news as I am. It is about being ranked the worst place to live or having the highest unemployment rate or record homicide rate or being last in education. So I decided to do something about it. I decided to take my message straight to the people and fight for the 505. This is our fourth debate. Neither of my opponents deserve to run this city. Keller has made tons of promises and spent hundreds of millions of dollars only to see the problems of crime and homelessness go up. Manny, you were fined twice by the campaign ethics board for committing voter fraud. You were reprimanded for it. You went to court and you lost five times over it. You shouldn't even be in this race because you broke the law during the qualifying phase of this election. You shouldn't be in this debate. It is up. You Thank should you. be in jail. Mr. Keller, your opening statement, you have one minute. You know, four years ago, I asked voters to trust me to lead, and I pledged that we would face our toughest challenges head on. And I know that for us, we have honored that commitment by digging deep and really working on the root causes that have held us back for decades, whether it comes to homelessness or fighting crime or job insecurity. What we've done is we've built a foundation to lift us up going forward. And I believe that we've got to continue that path. And it's what we saw last year with how we handled COVID, making tough decisions in a way that actually kept us safe and kept lives and livelihoods in place in our city. And so for us, I know what we've got to do going forward. We're determined to lead our city through this pandemic. That means our revitalized public safety efforts with our plan to stop the revolving door and gun crime. It also means what we're doing for thousands of good new paying jobs that are coming out. It also means continuing to be a national leader when it comes to sustainability. Now, no doubt today you're going to hear from my opponents. Mr. Kelly, your time channel. is up. Manny Gonzalez, your opening statement. You also have 60 seconds, please. Thank you for tuning in to this debate. Four years ago, Tim Keller promised to fight crime. And now four years later, crime is out of control and the criminals run the streets of Albuquerque. Also under his leadership, the homicide rate has been broken twice. It's time to go a different direction. I'm Manuel Gonzalez III. And I've dedicated my life to the service of our country and community. I've served honorably in the Marines and then became a police officer. I rose to the ranks and have been twice elected sheriff. I'm running for mayor because I'm serious about fighting crime and ending the homeless epidemic. What I am not is a stereotypical double talking politician. What I am is a proven leader that knows how to get the job done. Under my leadership, Albuquerque will be a much safer place to live, run a business, and raise a family. I hope to earn your vote today. Thank you. Now, we wanted to know from the people who live in Albuquerque about what concerns them and what the leader of this city needs to tackle most. I mean, really, we're facing a lot of issues that need to be addressed. I think the most important issue for Albuquerque is just trying to clean up our streets. Uh, the homeless population has been, I'd say it's been on a rise. I think the most important issue probably right now is the crime, like the number of shootings that we keep hearing about almost every weekend, every week, daily. Yeah, so the number's kind of staggering. It's really scary. Over and over, crime and homelessness comes up, so we will start with a focus on crime. Shelly Urbando has the first question directed to Mayor Tim Keller. 
Mayor Keller, overall statistics reported by the Albuquerque Police Department show some crime is down, but violent crime like homicide and rape is up. Why aren't your initiatives to lower crime working? And if elected to a second term, what would you do differently to lower violent crime? Mr. Keller, you have 90 seconds. Well, when you think about crime in our city, uh, it's important to note that violent crime is up everywhere in the country after the pandemic. And this is a situation where even the FBI has stated this is the worst year for violent crime in America. So what we're doing right here in Albuquerque is continuing a couple of pieces of the foundation to fight crime. Number one, we got 400 officers in the door and thank goodness that we did. And I'm graduating another 60 in just two weeks. We're going to continue adding to the ranks. We also know we have to continue investing in technology to fight crime. We've put $80 million into things like gunshot detection software and other crime fighting technologies that are going to help us going forward. But also I initiated the Metro Crime Initiative. And that's a one of its kind example of bringing leaders together in our community to stand up and say, what do we do to stop the revolving door? What do we do to combat gun violence? And now we know we have a list of several initiatives we're bringing to the legislature to make sure that we're actually doing things to keep people behind bars. And for the folks who do need a path to stay out, it's about meaningful diversion programs and opportunities to deal with things like addiction and mental health in a way that's not in prison. So we've got to address crime from all sides. That's what our administration's doing. And we built a foundation to make sure that we're actually going to be able to do that going forward. All right, Mr. Gonzalez, the next question is directed to you only and will be asked by journal reporter Dan McKay. Sheriff Gonzalez, you didn't equip, sh equip sheriff's deputies with body worn cameras until a state law made it mandatory. Your office has sometimes waited weeks to notify the public about homicides in the county. Tell voters why they should have confidence that you would run City Hall in an open and transparent manner. You also have 90 seconds. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, I do have cameras. And the reason I did not uh, select cameras, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to cameras, but what a lot of people don't know is when the cameras were placed on the Albuquerque Police Department is that's when crime started moving up. It removes officers from the streets literally costing the taxpayers thousands of man hours from them performing law enforcement duties. I would never compromise the safety of the citizen. Also, what they're not telling you is it's an obsolete technology that compromises the safety of officers. There's literally libraries from the Albuquerque Police Officers Association showing that our police officers are being spit on, pushed, pumped, pu uh, punched, women that their hairs are, hair is pulled, and being attacked. And I would never compromise the safety of an officer. I was never given the budget for that uh, uh, a camera. I do have the most advanced technology that doesn't put the obligation on the officer and is automated. It's the most, so it's the most advanced system in the country. It doesn't allow the officer to, to get rid of the evidence. It's cloud-based and it's an evidence-based system. This technology will benefit the public and officers for the next five, 10, 15, and 20 years. And we are the most transparent law enforcement agency in the state. Uh, the only reason we would not- Mr. Gonzalez, somebody your time is up. Homicide is because you would not Mr. Adagone, Mr. Gonzalez, your time is up. Mr. Adagone, Bob Clark from KKOB Radio has our next question. Mr. Adagon, uh, you have little experience when it comes to public policy, public safety. You've never over overseen a large public workforce. So tell the voters of Albuquerque why you believe you do have the appropriate experience and skills to run our city, especially one that's dealing with a violent crime crisis right now. Mr. Adagon, you have a minute and a half. Go ahead. So running a large organization, I've dealt with a lot of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, prior to my uh, radio career, I did a lot of things uh, in business working for a company by the name of C.B. Richard Ellis. And I worked uh, actually for Fortune 100 companies and a lot of their management consultings and their leaders and uh, those guys that were always here on the ground. And it's very important organizationally. We've got 6,900 employees in the city of Albuquerque. They need to be led and you need to jump out in front of them with real direction. And unfortunately, uh, neither one of my uh, competitors have done that. And you really have to go through each and every single one of those uh, departments in that organization to really inspire and take them to the next level. One of the things that I'm very good at, at doing is providing a vision. That's something that we haven't, happened, haven't had. Meet with each of the department leaders, talk with a lot of the uh, departments and do a forensic analysis. And you mentioned crime, Bob, and I think it's important to, to note here on crime, 
Why hasn't our mayor done a forensic analysis so that we understand the day to day of what's happening with our officers, with the police patrol, uh, with the sergeants, and then of course with leadership. So doing a full scale evaluation of this can be done in very short order and that forensic audit and accounting can be done inside. Then we can move to the next phase, which of course is leading them into a new direction. I'm the right guy because I will provide uh, goal setting, vision. There's no doubt that even in my own business and what I've done in competing with uh, such operations as yours, uh, winning the uh, five-time uh, award or four-time award for readers. Mr. Adagone, award. your time is up. I, I run my organization that Sticking way. Sticking with the very... topic of crime and policing, a question from one of our viewers about police reform. I do believe police reform needs to happen. With that being said, what can we do that still, we still have the police and they are able to do their job, but at the same time they have the training, um, maybe, maybe the equipment needed, um, but at the same time be held to a higher standard so that there isn't a power imbalance. Candidates, the Department of Justice is overseeing changes at the Albuquerque Police Department and has been for years. Does the DOJ oversight stand in the way of your own ideas of how to run the department? Mr. Adagone, you go first, 90 seconds. Well, one of the things that we need to understand about the Department of Justice is this is something that we, are, we, we, we live with. We are party to the decree, so it's also important for us to understand that we're the plaintiff in all of this. Uh, unfortunately, this does get in the way of any mayor who's going forward, just because we would run our department differently than either the ACLU or this uh, decree would allow us to do. And does it interfere directly? The question is, would it interfere with my objectives? I have to live with it, so I have to move forward. We have to accelerate our level of compliance, but we also have to back up and push as hard as we can uh, when it comes to our officers to just remove every obstacle work with the Department of Justice and really not uh, try to create, I guess, more obstacles, which is what the mayor has unfortunately done. I've heard from a lot of officers. They've come to me and they said the mayor's office has actually made it worse. So the big objectives are reducing every level of crime, prosecuting for misdemeanors, which under the current decree we can't do, but we can arrest, detain, and of course they're going to get back out there. If we can keep track of our criminals and and and, and and arrest for even the slightest uh, 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 crimes that are out there, I think we're going to do what we can to improve the crime rate around the city of Albuquerque. I do have to say that the Department of Justice uh, decree can be moved out of here within the next three to four years. Uh, but if we don't accelerate compliance, uh, we're not going to be able to adapt and move to uh, a new uh, operational structure going forward. Thank you. Mr. Kelly, your reply. Well, when it comes to reform, it's important that we understand we've got to be able to fight crime and we've got to be able to have reform. And this is where experience really matters. You know, it's not about what we want to do. I think as a community, I agree with the, the question in the sense that we know we've got to do both. The question is how. And that's what my administration is now demonstrating. We pulled out all the reform initiatives of the chain of command and created the superintendent of police reform. And since we've done that, we've been able to finalize the use of force training. That's exactly why the DOJ is here. And so now we're able to do that for all our officers. But we're also saying that the monitor and the DOJ process, they also have to work with us so that we can fight crime and do reform. And that's why we're saying we've got to have more flexibility when it comes to resources so that we can have the right amount of resources during reform and also the amount of resources actually uh, fighting crime on our streets. And that takes cooperative leadership, it takes folks who will bring everyone together and say, we've got to do both of these things simultaneously. And I also want to mention, it does come back to simple things like cameras. You have to have body cameras to have police reform, but also you have to have body cameras to bring justice, to have evidence, uh, to actually catch the folks that we need to catch. And that's why I think that last answer that was given by our sheriff is so dangerous. If you don't understand the connection with body cameras to fighting crime and with reform, then I don't think you're ready to lead this department. Certainly not ready to lead this city. And the last thing I'd say your about reform time is, is up, Mr. Keller. I'm sorry. Time is up, Mr. Gonzalez. You have 90 seconds for your reply. Yes, uh, the cameras don't hold people uh, accountable. Uh, people hold people accountable, and leaders do. And that's why the mayor does not understand this. I'm the only one that has experience. I'm the only one that has actual experience as a law enforcement officer. I've actually arrested people. I have uh, made both uh, been a practitioner, but a policymaker. And so what it comes down to is becoming reasonable with the people that you're actually having do the job. 
And that is it coincides with the expectations of the courts. Both of these individuals will not understand that. They're only at a 56% compliance rate, which is uh, they're far worse off than when the mayor started. They're regressing. You have to be able to not allow activist anti-police groups to make policies for police departments. You have to make them reasonable to the courts so that the Albuquerque Police Department can move on and be successful and keep the people safe in Albuquerque. That's what the people of Albuquerque are crying for right now is service and protection. And that's why this is a very important election to make sure that we have the most qualified candidate. And this, that candidate is speaking to you right now. Thank you. All right, Dan McKay has the next question for all of the candidates, Dan. For years, Albuquerque has budgeted for more police officers than it's been able to hire. What steps would you take to grow and sustain the police force? Mr. Keller, you go first. Well, fortunately, we've been able to bring in 400 new officers, 100 each year. And that was my commitment. Thank goodness that we did because we desperately need them on the streets right now. The challenge is we're having lots of retirements. And in part, it's because of uh, the substantial adjustments we made to actually reward our officers for the work that they do. But they're retiring out. And so that's an age issue. And it's about our, the way our retirement system works. So here's what we're doing. We continue to offer a pro compensation bonus. We also know that we're committed to 100 new officers every year. And we have literally graduating just a two, in two weeks, uh, another huge batch of officers. And so that's outstanding for what we need. But it's also about making the burden they have on them not so heavy by having an alternative response program. So we are now doing the Albuquerque Community Safety Department. And that is a alternative response to 911 so that our officers have less call volume. Instead, if there's a mental health issue or a behavioral health issue, we're sending out a social worker, somebody who's trained in the right way to be the right response at the right time. And that frees up our officers to do the kind of violent crime fighting that we need them to do. And it also is a much better way to deal with the issues of those callers because we're getting them the right response at the right time, not someone who could potentially escalate the situation or has nowhere to take them besides jail or the ER. This new department can actually get them the services they need. All right, your time so that's is up. how we have to work together. Mr. Mr. Gonzalez, you go next. You have 90 seconds. Yes, law enforcement is the neutral body of the government. They, they have to be that... Albuquerque Police Department has to be depoliticized. The mayor has politicized the police department to a fault where it cannot function anymore. You have to create an environment where the officers feel supported. It's no different than raising kids. They have to be uh, accountable. They have to have the support, they have to have the education, the resources. And of course, number one, they have to have the backing. They have to feel that when they get in these tough situations, they're gonna be supported and be held accountable but you never want to support anybody to a fault. The other thing is, is you have to do is provide them with the right leadership. Unless those people are willing to hold them accountable and, and not have the double standard and, and continue to sweep things under the rug and, and pay out all these whistleblower lawsuits and, and have all these other issues that the affairs of the mayor are not being covered because they're not willing to record everything. And so it's about accountability. So at least if you have the cameras, turn the cameras on so you can hold yourself accountable. I would encourage the mayor to do that so that the Albuquerque Police Department can move in the right direction. Mr. Aragon, you also have 90 seconds. Go ahead, please. I can't tell if uh, Sheriff Manny Gonzalez wants the cameras on or off. Uh, certainly his record is uh, something to speak about uh, there. Look, we have the DOJ compliance that's in there. That's driving police officers out, particularly when you're having to go ahead and continue to file all this paperwork. How do you guys keep these guys retained? Well, there's uh, $20 million, about $18.5 million in overtime that's there. I found another $50 million. We have to make them the best paid. I mean, it's already a hard enough job uh, to begin with. And we've got to stop to the mayor's uh, top, stop blaming the national trend that people are leaving police departments. It's his job to retain them, not pay attention to the rest of the country. We've had 90 plus police officers have left. Uh, I don't know that the mayor understands how many uh, officers he has. He has 896, not 1,100, as he wrote in the paper. You know, the officers right now are buying out to retire because they aren't supported. It's a ridiculous situation. And that's one of the reasons why crime has gone up. It's not because of the DOJ decree. It's because... 
our mayor is putting more and more obstacles in front of everything. Uh, I am absolutely on board, and uh, Sheriff uh, Gonzalez is now uh, jumping on my idea, which is a no settlement policy uh, for legal claims from criminals. Uh, we do have some things that we do have to comply with, but you know, we should be standing behind each of our officers every single time, uh, legally as well. You know, our guys are certified good guys. Why do we have lawyers running to this to go ahead and sue the city of Albuquerque? I will stop that day one. Our officers need to be supported. They need to be the number one paid. And I am the guy to ensure that they're doing. The Police Officer Association will not endorse either one of my competitors. Just like All right, Mr. Otter, going, your time is up. That for either one of them. Our I'm next topic Thank focuses you. on homelessness. It is something that is on the minds of many of the people we hear from every single day. How do you think that you're going to stop the homeless problem that we've got, which is also contributing to the crime. You know, we've lived across from this park for 40 years, and we see now, we see people doing drugs, we pick up needles. We've seen more people on the street corners begging for money, and it's just, there's gotta be a solution other than building some place to put people that are homeless. Candidates, obviously homelessness is a major problem here in Albuquerque. What is your plan to address this problem now and for years to come? Mr. Gonzalez, you go first. Well, I'm the only candidate that opposes legalizing uh, uh, encampments. It's a bad idea. We do not want to colonize this problem. Housing them in hotels is a bad idea. That's increased homicides. That's inhumane. That, that goes against in the best interest of those individuals. There's victims there like women that are having to stay up at night protecting their children. We need to provide them with a comprehensive plan. I have a comprehensive plan to work both with the county manager and other elected officials and stakeholders. But this in itself is not a problem for the city in itself. This is a community problem. We'll collaborate with stakeholders, nonprofits, uh, service providers, mental health, clinicians, social workers, it's, it's going to take all hands on board to solve this problem. The most important thing, we can't become uh, a magnet for homeless people. We can't provide them with these type of services where uh, people are sending them from other cities into Albuquerque. We need to make sure that we get these people reconnected when we can to their families and or their communities. We need to be able to stand up an advocacy center that provides all those services, the wraparound services that these people desperately need and, will, and have not and received any help in the last four years. And that problem continues to grow. It's grown from what the mayor said from 2000 when he took office and he was bragging down it's 5,000. And we do not want to become the hope, homeless capital of the world. Mr. Gonzalez, so, your time is up. Thank you. Mr. Aragon, 90 seconds as well. Well, uh, again, I'm confused. I'm not sure there are encampments, temporary encampments. Let's be proper about uh, that term that uh, Sheriff Manny Gonzalez just referred to. We have temporary encampments for 30 to 40 to five days. It's something that uh, Councillor Diane Gibson proposed. It's something that's actually done in other cities. It's a responsible way to actually make sure that the uh, problem doesn't become organic and we have organic growth of these encampments, which is something that both the mayor and the sheriff allowed uh, to happen. You have to, of course, uh, arrest for quality of life issues. Even if it, the arrest is a temporary 24 to 48 hour detainment, we've got to get control of our homeless population out there. And three, uh, 75% of them, three out of four of them, they're not there on their own accord. Some of them are drug addicted. Let's get them the help that they need. Let's make sure that we can track them. You know, some of them are mental issues. And then, of course, there's economic insufficiency. Those aren't the bad homeless people. Uh, we referred already to two to 5,000. Tim Keller wants to build tiny homes to the point of $900 a square foot, insane. Uh, I'm the only candidate uh, in all of this, uh, both uh, Sheriff Manny and Mayor Tim want to go ahead and go forth with this gate gateway center. We're doing real estate deals with Tim Trump here, uh, who's deciding to go ahead and do uh, business with the richest guys in town. And you can you imagine uh, the, the refit for all that? It doesn't make sense. As a mayor, you have a responsibility to increase property values, not because interest rates are low, because you have to make sure that the blight and the quality of life issues uh, that are there. These homeless people need help. We don't need to create uh, I'm bigger, Mr. Otago, and your time is up. Deal, Mr. Keller, Thank you me. also have 90 seconds to reply. Well, I think we've heard a lot of myths in the last couple of minutes in this debate. And look, first of all, some things that are being said, like comparing running APD to raising a family that our sheriff did earlier, is, is just completely disrespectful to officers in APD. Uh, and marginally also to those of us who are raising kids, including myself. 
these are serious issues and they're complicated. You can't just have some sort of soundbite and then pretend that you know what to do to run a city. And homelessness is very, very 30,000 homeless kids in APS. You have to understand these are kids, these are families. You can't just move them out. And you also can't just say things like we have to do better or we have to work together. As Eddie said, the sheriff's actually had eight years to help on this issue and he has literally done nothing. Now what our administration has done is an all of the above approach. We opened our West Side shelter 24 seven. We have 300 families living there. Absolutely a hotel is better than the streets. So during the middle of a pandemic, yes, I put homeless people in hotels and that saved lives. And it also means that we've got to look at the system as a whole. We need more supportive housing and affordable housing. We've built 500 units of that. We have another 500 coming. And we have to have the Gateway Center. I'm glad at least the sheriff and I agree on that. We need one place to take people to get them out. All right, our next question comes from Shelly Rabando, and it is for all three candidates. Shelly. Downtown is an area with high crime and a large homeless population. Mayor Keller supports a bond issue allowing for a stadium for New Mexico United to be built downtown. Do you support this? And if the stadium is built, how do you think it'll impact crime and homelessness downtown? Mr. Aragon, you go first. Uh, we have four different sites that have been selected for us. None of them will ultimately be able to satisfy what is needed and the impact. It's not going to be a positive overflow impact. These are things that happen temporarily. Uh, if you look at the schedule for the New Mexico United, and you look at the 20 plus games that they have a year, what do we do with the additional 335 days of the year that's, that, that's there? Are we gonna be renting that out? I am not in support of the uh, stadium, not for this $50 million bond that's gonna be put on top of us. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever just to get in and out of downtown. It's next to impossible uh, from a traffic uh, standpoint. Uh, the economic spillover, uh, that, in order to grow downtown, which uh, uh, Ms. Rabondo is actually your uh, uh, real question is, how do you uh, control the CBD, the central business district? That central business district has actually moved to the North I-25 because there's no amenities there. There's no homes there. There's nobody that's living down there except for the homeless. In order to kind of revitalize, we got to attract jobs, grow the economy, and uh, we've got 30% office uh, vacancy that's down there. Sort of the city uh, building is filled, certainly the county building is filled, but I got to tell you, I do not believe in the Albuquerque Rapid Transit. I don't believe in uh, creating this bond for this. We have to have real economic development with people who want to invest, put skin in the games, and realize that we have the infrastructure to support them. And they want to come to Albuquerque to do business, not just 20 days a year for 20 games a year. Uh, this is nothing more than uh, welded corruption between Mayor Killer's administration Mr. Adagone, and Peter Drew's your 90 seconds and are up. United. Thank you. Mayor, we know you support the stadium. How do you think it will change crime and homelessness? Well, I want to be clear that the, these issues are certainly indirectly related, but I want to step back and really just acknowledge what this is about. Like, this is just like when we wanted to bring the, the Dukes left, you know, and then we voted publicly to build a stadium and bring the isotopes in. And it's a city run stadium. The team pays off the debt, uh, which they have at isotopes. And we have a great thing that everyone in Albuquerque, New Mexico loves. This is just about doing the same exact thing, uh, but with the soccer team. So the idea is we've got a stadium, uh, they're the main tenant, they'll pay it off, we'll use it for other things, just like we do Isotope Stadium. And uh, it's just a good long-term investment for our families. So we have things that we can grow up enjoying. And soccer is a great sport in that, you know, folks like it from, from all demographics. And so for us, the location is really about, yes, I do think it'll lift up downtown. We have a situation where I can barely think of any successful downtown in America that does not have some sort of stadium. But this is also minor league soccer. So I think we got to look at things like El Paso, other towns that have minor league stadiums downtown. That's what this is about. And I think it'll be helpful with respect to bringing people down there, helping restaurants. And when you do that, whenever you make an active, vibrant downtown, it does help homelessness and it does help crime for sure. But the other thing is, it just makes this a great place to live and a place that we're proud of and we like going downtown to games. And so that's really what this is about. And we've got $50 million, but the team is All right, Mr. Keller, million. your 90 seconds it's are up. Mr. Gonzalez, your reply, 90 seconds as well. No, at this time, it's a horrible idea. It's a political ploy for, the, for Tim to try to get reelected. We need to get our home in order first. People are complaining about crime homelessness, uh, anti-business, anti-policing policies that the mayor has. The Albuquerque uh, downtown area 
is is dying. And then we have four more years of the mayor, uh, then Albuquerque is dead. So we need to get back to where where people understand that we have priorities in the city. And why we're running for office, all three candidates, is to address these issues. You have asked the questions earlier, and there's other ways to go about this. I've talked to other legislators, and they say there's matching funds at the state level. There might be a private uh, public relationship, a P3 opportunity there. But the, the taxpayers, to include myself, are sick and tired of being taxed to a fault where right now a lot of people are reconsidering moving because it's just too much for them to shoulder. So I am against it. Okay, Bob Clark has our next question for all the candidates. Candidates, recreational marijuana stores will soon begin sales in the next few months. Do you believe the new industry ultimately will be a positive or a negative for Albuquerque? Mr. Keller, you go first. Well, let me begin by just uh, clarifying a couple of things that I think were just blatantly misleading that we just heard. Look, the stadium project is going to create hundreds of new jobs. That, by definition, is economic impact, and that's a good thing. I also know the city of Albuquerque as mayor, you know, as a leader, you've got to do more than one thing at once. And we are investing in homelessness. We put $500 million in supportive housing. And so to say we can also put $50 million aside that will be paid back to us at the same time, that's just good management. That's just how you run a city doing more than one thing at the same time. And I also want to mention that, you know, when it comes to this question around, you know, cannabis and things like that, uh, this is here no matter what, state law. And I think if done properly, it'll help us. But that's why I do support making sure that we keep things local, that we make sure and support local companies who are doing this. But I was leading the charge to say, we got to have adequate regulations. You know, we got to make this work like Durango and not like cities like Trinidad. I want to make sure we do not have these sort of green light districts. I want to make sure that our historic neighborhoods keep their historic character, but also that we support entrepreneurs. So I think when done right, it works well. And that's why it takes someone who knows the difference between just talking about a problem and someone who can actually work through and problem solve. And I think on all of these issues, whether it's the stadium, crime, or homelessness, that's what my administration and I have demonstrated over the last four years. And that's what we need going forward. All right, Mr. Gonzalez, you also have a minute and a half. Go ahead, please. I'd be interested if Mary Keller is going to put him at the Albuquerque Country Club because where he will put him is in these underserved, marginalized areas where people are underserved. And I believe that at this point, I, th I thought the legislation was bad timing. Uh, also, they have to move forward and we'll have, to, uh, we'll have to work through those issues as we move along. So I also wanted to follow up a little bit more about uh, the mayor being in office. When he took office to the point now, he's increased the budget by $181 million. And now he's asking for another uh, push for this stadium. But when we got in return was higher crime, the worst homeless uh, increase in the whole nation and the worst economy. I think that's a bad return on our taxpaying dollars. Thank you. Mr. Aragon, your reply. Yeah, neither one of my, uh, boy, these are the guys that are leading the city, folks. Neither one has answered the question. And uh, Mayor Keller puts it, cannabis and things like that. Shame on you, Mayor Tim Keller. We're talking about the complete and total 180 on our culture and wanting to legalize it. And Sheriff Manny isn't much better, calling it bad timing. So he's on board to go ahead and legalize marijuana. I'm going to answer your question directly, Bob, because this is something that's going to increase crime. It's going to increase a high level of homelessness. We know we let's go a little bit further uh, north to from Durango and Trinidad. And let's on, move on up the road to Denver. And let's see where Denver is trucking their homeless right here to Albuquerque. Go out, ask out on the streets. They've got a unbelievable homeless problem that they cannot manage this could not be worse and it's this crony capitalism that's coming from the likes of darren white and his donations to michelle Lujan grisham to legalize it and the very people on the left doing the very same thing uh, as well i'm absolutely sick i'm so glad that you brought this up we have reversed our culture here and to say that this is okay to my six-year-old and my nine-year-old to tell them that it's okay to go ahead and smoke pot it's okay to go ahead and have certain i mean we're stopping at stoplights now we're at this particular point where you're seeing people just strike it up at, at, at a stoplight. Come on. We know that this is wrong. We know it's bad. And policing it, we can't even police our homeless. 
we can't even police anything else out there. What makes you think that we're going to go ahead and get back to law and order and be able to police the people okay, who Mr. are Adagone, smoking? Okay, Mr. your time Terrible. is up. Thank, Thank you. you. We are now to the portion of the debate where candidates ask one other candidate a question. Now, you can't take longer than 30 seconds to ask it, and we will be timing it. And the answer must be given in 90 seconds. Mr. Gonzalez, your question first. Yeah, my question's to Tim. You ran, our, you ran for office saying crime in the mayor, is the mayor's responsibility, but you now blame rising crime on COVID and national trends. But crime has been up your entire term, and your first broke an annual homicide, broken ha annual homicide record in, the, in 2019. That was long before COVID-19 and, and, and before any national trend. Isn't that? Okay, Mr. Gonzalez, you your time said. is up for your question. Mr. Kelly, go ahead and reply. Well, uh, based on the sheriff reading that question, uh, I want to just highlight that it's not even factually correct. As you stated earlier in this broadcast, you know, auto theft is down. We cleared the rape kit backlog. Total crime numbers are down. And look, we have to tell the truth. The truth is that violent crime is up all over the country and here. And so I do take responsibility for doing something about that. And so, so that's why when I got together the leaders of Metro area for law enforcement, our DA, our AG, the, even the governor's office, even our legislators, city councils from both parties and county commissioners. We sat down and we created the Metro Crime Initiative, 40 ways to stop violent crime in the metro area. And there was only one law enforcement official who did not show up, and it was the sheriff, because he was actually said he was too busy campaigning. That to me is embarrassing. So I know we have challenges, but with me, you get an approach that will address them head on. And I'll come up with some answers. And that's what the Metro Crime Initiative is all about. It's about stopping the revolving door. It's about fighting gun violence. And it's about specific ways in which we can support each other, including the courts, to keep those who belong behind bars behind bars. And I did that together as a leader in our community. And you were nowhere to be found for that. Mr. Aragon, you now have the opportunity to ask one of your opponents a question. Go ahead, please. Yeah, there was a lot of reading there on that question, so uh, that's also very curious. But I wasn't aware that we were going to be able to ask anybody. And for both of my Democrat opponents, Manuel Gonzalez III and Tim Keller, I'd like to ask them both the very same question and leave the rest of, of my time with a little bit of preamble. I mean, I'm not a Democrat. I'm a Republican. And these two guys, in our worst time, were beating each other up for five months before they got into court. Why were they not focused on the issues of this city at the most important critical time. Okay, your time is up, Mr. Adagone. Mr. Adagone, you have to select one of your opponents to answer that question. You cannot direct it to both. Which one would you like to answer? Tim Keller, please. Okay, Mr. Keller, Thank go you. ahead. Well, when it comes to being mayor, you have to lead a city. And when you lead a city, it means that you have to be able to address multiple issues at the same time. I've got to be able to support our police chief with the resources that our police chief needs. I've got to be able to support our fire and EMTs with the resources they need. I've got to set goals and I have to hold people accountable. And that's what you've seen. And so when it comes to actually looking at our police department and saying, okay, here's the new technology that you need for gunshot detection. When it comes to changing out the leadership because things weren't getting done, I brought in a new chief. That's what leadership is at the city. And it also means we've got to do things like actually address root causes when it comes to poverty. And when it also comes to things like building up our economy, those are the things that the mayor has to do day in and day out. And I know I've demonstrated loud and clear that I have worked incredibly hard at this job, in addition to holding us together during the pandemic. I've been battle tested. There has been no greater challenge our city has faced than the COVID-19 pandemic. And whether it was supporting dozens of businesses with tents or whether it was supporting hundreds of businesses with economic support so they wouldn't close or $300 million in infrastructure investments or keeping 10,000 kids whose parents had to work safe and in our community centers during the pandemic. That's leadership, and that's what I've been doing over the last two years. <clears throat> Keller, you now have an opportunity to ask a question of one of your challengers. Go ahead, please. Sure. My question is for Manny, and it's really about, you know, I think we saw early on in this campaign, you make a commitment to saying that you're going to bring in people to run the city. But when it comes to your campaign and taking responsibility for what your campaign admitted in the Albuquerque Journal, that it was fraud and forgeries in your own campaign, and the inspector general's report saying that they were forged by your personal assistant and your campaign spokesperson. What are you going to do to make sure that doesn't happen going forward? 
First, I want to be clear about my support of cameras before I answer his question, and we already have them. Also want to make sure that when I take office as mayor is that there's a checks and balances because, because the mayor's uh, corrupt city clerk, not holding him accountable, stating that he didn't do his job and then going to the courts and say they violated my due process, which are my constitutional rights, which will be bringing a lawsuit against the mayor and his clerk for violating the law is I will hold ourselves accountable just like I hold the staff, just like I hold my people. But I, you can't hold me accountable just like if somebody gets commits a crime if if they did something. But what I, I've, I've always done is held myself accountable. I hold public office. I hold them to the highest standard. And I've never been accused. And I still haven't been found guilty of anything he said. They're all administrative orders. And we've moved on. And this is as petty as you can get. But it proves that the people support me and believe me because nobody's outraised anybody since we went to public finance. And that's what concerns the mayor. The only things he's concerned about is his politics. He never puts people first. Okay, our next question comes from the journal reporter, Dan McKay. Dan? Candidates, some of New Mexico's largest employers are requiring their workers to get vaccinated against COVID-19. Do you support a vaccine mandate for city of Albuquerque employees? What steps, if any, would you take to boost vaccination rates among the municipal workforce? Mr. Gonzalez, you go first. No, I don't support uh, uh, mandatory vaccinations. What I do support is people's individual rights. Uh, we, I, we, as employers, need to provide them with the adequate PPE equipment, uh, personal uh, protection equipment, so they can uh, be safe. We need to inform them. Everybody needs to make that individual decision themselves. And if they choose not to be vaccinated, there needs to be other measures in place, like testing prior to going to uh, to work, if that's a, one of the conditions to keep people safe. But no, I don't, and, and, and I do not approve of mandatory vaccinations at the local level. Mr. Keller, you also have a minute and a half. Go ahead, please. Well, after hearing a little bit of this discussion, I think it's important to say that as mayor, you got to get used to being accountable for everything, uh, whether it's raining outside or whether crime is high or whether the stop signs are in place. That's what Albuquerque, that's what Albuquerque expects of its mayor. And so for our sheriff to say that he's not accountable, I think it shows that he's not ready to be mayor. Also with five losses in five different legal venues, including the Supreme Court and a district court judge who literally said that our clerk was justified in uh, withholding funds because of fraud and forgeries in the sheriff's campaign. Uh, well, the definition of accountability and responsibility is owning up to that. You should just apologize and move on. And then to say somehow that your fundraising is the equivalent of justice is completely disturbing when it comes to how our electoral process works. I'm glad I'm publicly financed. I don't know anything to anyone. And that's why you know what you get with me. I'll tell you the truth straight up. And the straight up truth with vaccinations is I support them. I want everyone to get them. But I also know we have to be able to do that legally. And we've got to be able to work with our collective bargaining units, the contracts we have, and we're going to do everything we can. But I also am not going to make false promises. And so this is a tough issue. I just want everyone to get vaccinated and we'll push them as hard as we're allowed to legally. Mr. Aragon, your reply, 90 seconds, please. Uh, I am unvaxxed and I believe in medical choice. Sheriff Manny is suddenly moving the goalposts for himself, taking credit and coming up with an idea as he is, he, if he's for choice. Uh, Bernalillo County and the city of Albuquerque, due to my uh, recent entry into the race, has now led both of them to no mandatory uh, vaccine. And that's important because that would have driven people out of both of those uh, agencies. Also, the mandatory vaccine, if it's a choice, if you feel like you need it, then go ahead and do it. The vaccinations, uh, sure, after full FDA approval, you may think that you have FDA approval, but that's a longer period of time. We've run this experiment long enough. And... Back to Sheriff Gonzalez, I did get thrown out of Cafe 6855 within eight minutes of a call that he did. So for him to go ahead and say that he doesn't believe in mandatory anything, his sheriff's office, uh, he has not made that happen in there. We've run the experiment long enough. It's time to get people back to work. No capacity limits, no masks, no COVID vaccines, uh, no lockdowns or pulling health permits, permits of businesses. He's in charge of an agency that's been doing exactly that, just like the city of Albuquerque. These are, who, these are people who have been forced into a situation, 
not of their own choosing. And people have medical choice and they can choose for themselves. We now have Sandia National Labs, Los Alamos National Labs with this uh, mandatory vaccination. Both of these guys are Democrats. Both of these guys are for mandatory vaccine, regardless of what they're telling you here today. We've seen it within their departments. We've seen it within their city of Albuquerque. I am not for that. Okay, Mr. Otagone, your time is up. We're going to stick with COVID so you have a little bit more time to amplify your response. If you like, Shelley, you have the next question. Eventually, federal COVID funds will be gone with no more money for all the programs to help families, businesses and social programs. How do you plan to sustain the city's budget and protect the people of Albuquerque who need the most help? Mr. Otagon. So there's $35 million in CARES that went directly to the Albuquerque Fire Department. I found that money. I'm going to reallocate that money. Let's get people back to work. The mayor has said, well, go ahead and stay on unemployment and uh, the subsistence as long as you possibly can. And then come to us for a job where you get a signing bonus in the city of Albuquerque. How do we get people back to work? Well, we put them back to work and you lead by example by going back to work. People might make fun of me for this, that, or being at the office, or being in my home, or being in the radio station all the time. Let me tell you, I was helping the shut-ins. I was helping the people who were socially distanced. I was helping the people who had to stay in. Where were either one of these gentlemen during this entire time? This whole thing with COVID is nonsense, and it's most nonsense to the essential and non-essential, both of which these gentlemen made sure that they were going to go ahead and force. Our small businesses have been punished. They've been re reduced somewhere between 40 to 52 percent. We're trying to bring them back here, but they've scattered to Arizona, Utah, Colorado, Oklahoma. We've got to attract and bring these people back in. And we've got to send a clear signal that we are not going to go ahead and allow any more of these lockdowns or shutdowns. I've been doing that. I've been fighting on behalf of not just the employees, but the employers who have been trying to keep things above water. We've got mandates for 99 plus employees. Both of these guys are gonna go ahead and enforce them. I will fight back against the governor. She's gone through two Department of Health uh, and an epidemiologist and all that. We're gonna challenge the science. We're gonna not take the mandates that come directly uh, from the state of New Mexico. And we're gonna work with our local businesses and our local providers and our okay, health care uh, officials up. to make Thank sure you. that things are good. Mr. Thank Gonzalez, you. you go next. Yes. That the money that was given through the CARES Act needs to go back to the people that it was intended to go to and, and not put into the general budget. So that money needed to go back to businesses so they can incentivize people going back to work. And so they would be had, have them adequately staffed. Right now you're hearing complaints throughout the business community is that they can't employ anybody because they feel that they've um, become uh, dependent on some of the money that the mayor has handed out and is not requiring them to go back to work. So I understand that's a great benefit, but on the other hand, people need, uh, we need an economy and we need people to do work for these small businesses. We need to be supportive of people that are actually uh, supporting and actually funding the gross receipts, taxes it takes to have a budget. And so therefore I would make sure that all the money is dispersed into the, uh, to the, back to the people and not just to a select few. Mr. Keller, your reply. Um, I think we've seen pretty clear how I handled the pandemic. And you want to know what I was doing. I was making tough decisions to save lives and to save livelihoods. And I actually believe that even if you're not going to vote for me, folks do believe that we did a great job during the pandemic under my leadership. And so this is, I think, a very good example of the difference between candidates. These two other candidates aren't even aware of how good our economy is doing. We have announced 6,000 new jobs in the metro area. That's more than we announced in the last decade. And if you look at what happened during COVID, we had lower spread rates. We had lower positive case rates. Now we have higher vaccination rates. And the result is Albuquerque is a healthier place to live during a pandemic. And it's not going unnoticed. For the first time in years, people are moving here more than they're moving away. Our kids are staying here to go to school. And all of a sudden we see actually a situation where there are jobs available and just not enough people to fill them. That's a good economic challenge to have. And it's because of the work that we put in, bringing in things like Netflix, NBC Universal, Amazon, Facebook. These, this is now the modern masthead of Albuquerque. We are coming out of the pandemic in a tremendously stronger place than we were going in economically. And we're doing better than all the cities around us. You compare us to Phoenix, Denver, Tucson, we have higher growth rates and we have safer health rates. And that is the future of Albuquerque. Okay, Bob Clark has the final question for each candidate. If you are elected mayor next month, a year from now, how will the city look under your leadership? Mr. Keller, you're first. A year from now, I believe the city's gonna have a outstanding gateway center at the old Lo Loveless Hospital 
And what that's going to do is it's going to be a place where a homeless and shelter can go to get things like job training, housing vouchers, sober up, detox, behavioral health treatment. So in a year, we're going to have less people on our streets. We're going to have more people getting help. I also believe we're going to have an economy where all of the new jobs that we've announced, ranging from NBC Universal to even local jobs like Bueno Foods, we're going to have a situation where folks have multiple choices to go to work at. And that's a good thing. I also believe that we're going to have more officers on the streets because I'm graduating another 50 in just a couple of weeks. And I also know we have another 70 in the pipeline to continue 100 new officers every year. I also believe our city is going to feel safer because our new Albuquerque Public Safety Department is also going to be responding to down and out calls, mental health calls, freeing up officers to fight crime, but also getting people the help that they need at the right time through our 911 system. I also believe that we're going to have an even cleaner, more sustainable city because we're going to be 100% renewable by just 2026. That's awesome. We're going to be one of the leading cities in the country for that. And on top of that, I also believe we're going to be culturally vibrant. We own who we are in Albuquerque. I love this city. And I know I'm going to continue to promote it and make sure that we have a vibrant tourism industry and we stay true to ourselves going forward. Mr. Gonzalez, your reply. Here in my leadership, Albuquerque will be a much safer place to live, work, run a business, and raise a family. It'll also be a much safer, uh, a much better place because City Hall will be depoliticized and we'll fleece ourselves of all the politicians that are currently running the city of Albuquerque into the ground. We'll give people at the city of Albuquerque the opportunity to be promoted within and build the infrastructure that Albuquerque needs for the future to provide adequate services for licensing, permitting for small businesses, and also provide Albuquerque Police Department with the support and leadership they need so they can get back in the streets and be proud and, and, and be appreciated by the people to protect them. No longer will you have to worry about uh, being accosted or attacked at intersections where this out of control homeless issue is being uh, enabled by the mayor and his policies. And will be no longer where it's a safe haven for criminals will restore Albuquerque to be a livable and attractable city, and it will be at the top of the charts. And I want everybody to help me restore, help me and join me in restoring Albuquerque as a crown jewel of the Southwest. Thank you. Mr. Aragon, you have the final answer. Thank you. Uh, so back to the previous question, uh, when it comes to Manny Gonzalez, apparently he is uh, handing out rebate checks with the CARES Act money. We're gonna give money back to the people. That's not what's gonna happen with the city of Albuquerque. Uh, and we need that CARES Act money that's going to go directly and we're going to reallocate it to the general fund. And that's very important. So that's going to be done almost day one. Our police officers are going to be the very best paid. And uh, Mayor Keller, to your point about us having more growth than Phoenix or more growth than these other places, uh, everybody know that that's a, just a bold faced lie. We have had not, before COVID 915,000 jobs. Now, after COVID, we have 864,000 jobs. My platform is really simple. Crime, reduce every category, no exceptions. We'll have lower crime one year from now. How much? Well, I'll talk about that when I close. Commerce, grow it. Stand behind small businesses. Remove the Albuquerque Rapid Transit. I'll be out there with my shovel or my sledgehammer if I have to. Uh, COVID, challenge it. Hire local epidemiologist. That's important. Uh, Dr. Alexander is a great example of that. Remove the corruption everywhere. There will be no stadium deal. That's not going to happen. And I'm going to run it like somebody who loves it. I'm going to be out and about within the crime department. That's the most important within the city of Albuquerque department. Uh, it's not just going to be one auto theft. We have to build the departments that are non-existent with ABD. We'll have a commercial burglary. We'll have a residential bur burglary department. We'll have a gang unit that's f fully staffed. In fact, our crime impact detectives will be a 100 uh, percent staff. And that's really important. These promises Manuel Gonzalez has had eight years. Tim Keller has had four years. We're not in a better situation. They were both standing on Mr. that Adagone, stage. Mr. Adagone, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Now each candidate will have one minute for their closing statements, and we begin with Mr. Gonzalez. Go ahead, please. I've paid attention to the overwhelming outcries for help and service in the city of Albuquerque. The people are telling me their number one concern is crime, and they're sick and tired of it, and so am I. The next pressing issue is homelessness. These two issues are hindering the growth of our city. I have the experience, the fortitude, the relationships, and the willpower to help solve these problems. I want, if, if you want Albuquerque to have better results, vote for me. Again, my name is Manuel Gonzalez III. 
I'm asking you to join me in restoring Albuquerque as a crown jewel of the Southwest and vote for me on November 2nd. I'd like to thank the audience for taking the time to listen to this debate. I would also like to thank KOAT, KKOB, and the Albuquerque Journal for hosting this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keller. Well, I think today has been a good example of lots of talk about the problems. It's easy to lay out a bunch of cliches and try and campaign based on, on things like reducing crime. The question is, how are we gonna do that? And also what leader is gonna be able to get that done? And I believe we've gotta keep moving forward. I have answers, a path going forward, whether it's the Gateway Center for Homelessness, whether it's our community safety department to deal with the unsheltered and help APD, whether it's investing in crime fighting technology or stopping the revolving door or dealing with gun violence and increasing legislation up in Santa Fe to do that. Those are answers to our problems. And that's what you get with the second term for me. I also know that from the sheriff's standpoint, it's a glass house campaign. He has been around for all of this longer than I have. And so I think you know what you get with me. You get leadership that's going to make tough choices. That's going to tell it like it is. That's going to problem solve. Mr. Kelly, your time is up. Thank you. Mr. Aragon, your final statement, please. We need a mayor who runs Albuquerque like they love it. Too often politicians get into office for the power, the clout, the publicity of the big show. And it doesn't really matter what they do with their time in office. I want to be mayor, not because I like politics. I actually hate it. I'm doing it because I love the city and I want to see it succeed. As mayor, I'll post my campaign promises on the city's website and send regular updates to the media to make sure I'm held accountable. Here's a promise. If I fail, I won't run again. If homicides aren't halved by the end of my first term, I won't run again. If homelessness isn't 75% lower, I won't run again. I'll own it and I'll pass the reins to someone who can do a better job because that's all I want from City Hall. Leadership you can see when you walk down the street, not just leadership you read about in the papers. I'm not in this for politics. I'm not for power, prestige, or publicity. That's not what civic duty is about. It's about contributing to the city you love and living it better than you found it. As I said, when I first launched this campaign, I realized that the mayor's office can be a dead end political job. That's perfect for me because I have no political ambitions. I just want to live in a better city. Fight for the 505. Let's put up our Dukes for the Duke City. Mr. Ardegon, thank you. Now, candidates, thank you for participating in our debate. You can vote now in this election. You can absentee vote by contacting your county clerk. Now, those ballots do have to be back by October 28th. Early voting begins October 16th and ends October 30th. Election day is November 2nd. Polls are open from 7 to 7. We are dedicated to providing you all the information you need so you're prepared to cast your ballots. On October 27th, KOAT presents Commitment 2021. Your vote, your future. It's at 6.30 p.m. We'll see you.